my name is Stephen Walker and I am a psychologist here in the Boulder area. I've been here about almost 40 years and uh, actually ran into some people at lunch that I know going way back so it's kind of a, a delight to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, my talk today is uh, a journey. Uh, it, it covers the essence of the work that I do with very high-end athletes and also how is it I needed to apply those skills and the training that I was doing with them to deal with a health challenge that I had in the last year. So if I consider what the through line is, you know, these athletes have been uh, pretty much the, the kind of things that have enabled me to learn more and more. They have been my greatest teacher. And it's through the things that they're looking to navigate through that have been difficulties, problems, issues, challenges of all kinds. Because people forget that even though people may be an elite athlete, they are people first. They have relationships that go sideways. They, have th they get injured. They have things that are a challenge to them that they need to overcome. And I never really thought about it that much until that was pretty much all I was thinking about. So I grew up in Denver. I went to Cherry Creek High School. Uh, I was a swimmer of some repute at Cherry Creek. We had uh, very good teams. I also played football. I've done 33 boulder boulders and a few triathlons and uh, have enjoyed a very athletic existence throughout my life. I might have continued to perform uh, collegiately in swimming, uh, but I discovered the beer drinking team and that somehow took over precedence. Uh, I'm not so sure how I feel about that now, but uh, there's plenty of time to drink beer. I just didn't, uh, became more social, let's just say at a time when I was kind of breaking out. Boulder, Colorado is the perfect place to be if you work with athletes because there are so many great athletes in this town. Probably per capita, there are more athletes that have distinguished themselves internationally in this town than probably anywhere else except possibly San Diego. But there are a lot of athletes and anybody that is engaged in endurance sports, running, triathlon, um, even some swimmers, uh, they tend to gravitate toward this, this environment, both because of all the things that we enjoy here, but also because of the high altitude training and the way in which it really helps an athlete um, get the most from the oxygen that they carry through their bloodstream. When I started out, uh, I had a... <laughs> I, I used to go, when I was working on my doctorate at CU, um, I used to go play basketball at Carlson Gym. And for those of you that are familiar with CU, uh, Carlson Gym is a teeny little place right across from the rec center. And it is adjacent to the field house. And upstairs in Carlson Gym, there are some classrooms. Well, the locker rooms were downstairs and I had to go to the bathroom one time and I, I decided, well, they gotta be bathrooms upstairs. They're classrooms, right? Isn't there some kind of law that says you have to have bathrooms up where they're classrooms? So I, I run up and I'm going up and down the hall and I walk into this room and I am just amazed. It is huge. It has treadmills, it has oscilloscopes everywhere. And this guy comes up from behind me and goes, what are you doing here? Well, I peeled myself off of the ceiling and I turned around and I met uh, a man by the name of Art Dickinson, who was the head of the Human Performance Laboratory. He was a very distinguished professor. Uh, I didn't know who he was, but he introduced himself and we had a lengthy conversation that resulted into a 20-year mentorship. So. What I did at the Human Performance Laboratory was first work with their community fitness program. 
And uh, he wanted to know, when he found out that I was working with stress-related disorders, he wanted to know, did I have any little assessment tools that he might provide to some of the police departments, fire departments, people that were coming through the, to the lab <clears throat> to do a basic fitness evaluation. So they were doing treadmills and they were working on some athletes high end were doing VO2 max. There were a lot of different kinds of, of assessments that they were doing. But for the firefighters, they just wanted to screen anybody that was at cardiovascular risk and wanted to give them a nutritional prescription and a stress prescription and that was my role in that facility. Dickinson was a, a marvelous man. He was a, one of the brain trusts behind the Pro Football Scouting Combine. He was one of the guys that was a regular consultant to the Olympic Training Center. He was one of the group of people that did research on fast twitch, slow twitch, muscle fiber, and the relationship to endurance versus sprinting athletes and for runners. And uh, besides that, he was just a really great guy. Unfortunately, we lost him about three months ago, and, uh, but his reputation will continue to stay in this, in this Boulder region. So in that time frame, beginning at the Human Performance Laboratory, he introduced me to the track and field coach, who at that time was Jerry Quiller, who introduced me to the track and field coach that came in after him, Mark Wetmore. Um, also the golf coach, uh, Mark Simpson, and did a, uh, a number of things with golf uh, and athletes, mostly track and field athletes, but other athletes at the university. And, and my job was just to kind of evaluate them and give them a stress management prescription. But that ultimately ended up being, in some cases, a very, very long-term uh, relationship working with them. About seven years ago, I started working on a blog and, uh, and decided to extend that into a sports psychology magazine called Podium Sports Journal. And I was recruiting people from the Association for Applied Sports Psychology, which is an organization that I belong to. They credential sports psychologists that are working in this field, people that are part of that group also have the potential to be vetted by the, the U.S. Olympic Committee and they actually have a registry of sports psychologists that work with Olympic athletes in a variety of different sports. So um, I got to be able to do that and I've recruited some of those people to write articles for Podium and so it's readable, credible, practical information in what are the best practices in applied sports psychology. And what that all includes is a bunch of other stuff. Mostly performance skills, mental skills training. Um, an athlete has to know how to be able to control their arousal level. If you've ever gone and, and been up early enough to see the A wave in the Boulder Boulder, you'll see people that are very seasoned runners in that A wave and there will be a fair number of people that are just really cutting their teeth wanting to race with some pretty high-end athletes. The people that win the A wave in the Boulder Boulder have, at least on one occasion that I know of, uh, run that race faster than the pro athletes that have been in that race. So it's not one of those things where and you'll have people, somebody's over in the corner throwing up, and somebody else is, you know, just panicked, and you can see they're just starstruck, or they're, they're having different issues managing their arousal level. And so I work with people on how to breathe to be able to manage that. Anybody in here do yoga on a regular practice, regular routine? Okay. And... Is it Sina? Is that yes. how you pronounce it? Mm -hmm. So how do you use breathing in yoga? I just do my best to get through that 60 minute class. That's all I do. <laughs> okay. Are you doing any particular kind, power yoga, uh, Bikram, anything like that? I've done it all. I really just use at my age, I use uh, yoga to balance uh, strength with flexibility. So my number one goal with yoga is to just stay flexible. Excellent. You know, they say that the number one cause of death after 80 is the fall. 
follow up right here. So if you do yoga, it balances the inner ear and you have a better balance. So you know, I've done yoga for 35 years and I'm probably the worst student in the class. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fact of the matter is it's working for you yes. and so you really are gravitating toward <laughs> it and uh, you employ it at least on a regular basis. One of the things that I think is so uh, interesting in controlling arousal level is the way in which people breathe. So I want to give you a little technique to start with and what I, this is an introduction basically for you to ask questions and that we have a dialogue going back and forth. Uh, this is a small group. It's more of an intimate setting. I really appreciate that. So anybody that does have something that they want to ask about. If I don't know, I'll tell you, or I might defer to somebody. But in any case, um, here's, here's what I think is really important about breathing. We have two different nervous systems. We've got the autonomic nervous system and we've got the voluntary nervous system. And if I were asked to do a roadside sobriety test, my voluntary nervous system would be really valuable in how I'm able to execute that. However, the involuntary nervous system is really critical for our being able to manage the stress, uh, the stress arousal that we experience in our body. Uh, our nervous system hasn't evolved that much in the last several thousand years. And if we were up in the mountains and we were hiking and a saber-toothed tiger jumped out behind a rock and goes, grr, which means dinner, then how many in this room are going to run? Yeah. Everybody. And how fast do you have to run? Faster. faster than me. Okay, and if you're faster than me, then I'm dinner, and you guys are going to be stressed out for hours. Might take you a long time to come down from that, particularly if you lost your buddy. You know, and so what you have is you have a highly reactive nervous system to urgency and to high stress provoking events, but it will take a long time for that nervous system to calm down. So what I want you to do is I want you to be aware of what that is actually in your body, the impulse that if you get control over it, you can do a better job of regulating your arousal level when you get to situations that may be more stressful. So here's the technique. Look up at the ceiling and just let your jaw hang. Okay, now bring your head down level so that your eyes are level and your jaw still relaxed and say, yo baby. Yo baby. All right, you got this really relaxed jaw here and that's an important thing because this autonomic nervous system feeds these internal organs and it comes off of the third cervical vertebrae. And so if you're clenching your teeth, that sends a ripple effect through your nervous system to reinforce tension throughout your body. So relax your jaw. All right, and then go down to the base of the sacrum, okay? So think about this. If you were gonna bring tension into the base of the sacrum and hold for a count two, three, four, very tight, and then release, then you're gonna be aware that you have either a relaxation response or not so much in the base of the sacrum or the pelvic floor. And there are a lot of people that carry an undue amount of stress and it will center more in their lower abdomen in the base of the sacrum. And so they're stiff and they're stiff legged in how they walk and it's, they don't move so fluidly. And it would be one of those things that if they were to work on that, they might be able to exercise a much higher degree of the ability to relax on demand. So relax the jaw, relax the pelvic floor, your shoulders, your hands, and your feet. Now take a nice, long, slow breath down to the lower abdomen into a heavy sigh. <sighs> okay, good. Now I'm noticing one person back there going like this, and the shoulders don't need to come up. Just let the shoulders hang, the sigh comes from within. <sighs> okay, now... Here's the point. Close your eyes, do that heavy sigh, and notice what it feels like when you're letting go of that breath. Pay attention inside and notice what that feels like. Ready, go. Go 
and do it again and pick and take another note. Okay. Now, Marty, what do you notice? Well, I feel relaxed all over down to my toes. Okay. All right. Rhett, what do you <clears throat> notice when you're letting go of the breath? Uh, happiness. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So you guys are translating this. Does anybody just get the sensation of everything dropping down in their torso? Yes. Just that, just that sensation of everything going, oh. All right. And the fourth step to that is to just pause at the end of the breath, put a period at the end of the sentence so that you're not linking those breaths too quickly. But the main point is that sensation that you get when you're dropping down, that dropping down sensation inside your, that is the parasympathetic calming response in your nervous system. And if you were doing biofeedback work and you were monitoring your heart rate, throughout an inhale and an exhale, your heart rate will speed up a little bit on an inhale, but it will slow down on the exhale. And that's the part that we really want to emphasize. That letting go sensation, just zoom in on it, just the moment of everything dropping in your torso. That's what you want to zero in on. And the other thing, that if you do pay attention to your respiration rate that way, you end up slowing down your breathing pattern. So rather than doing 12 respirations in a minute, you might only do five. Or some people will breathe as many as 20 respirations in a minute, and if they can slow themselves down to six or seven respirations, that's a really significant shift in their physiology. And that is an exercise in biofeedback which we'll talk a little bit about later on. These other things that are important in terms of performance skills training involve routines and preparations. You have a pre-race routine. You have preparations that you do the night before. I give the athletes that I work with uh, instructions on how to craft a confidence journal. And every day they write in their confidence journal. Now, Rhett, you're a runner, so you probably keep a running log, but this would be an add-on to your running log because when you put in there the one good thing that you did that day in that workout, and it may be that you showed up on time because the rest of the workout wasn't so good. But even if you find you've got a training session and there's a lot that you're covering in that, if there's only one or two things that you did really well in that training session, those are the ones that you want to record. So when we look at the tenets of positive psychology and we're looking to try and uh, repeat on demand those things that we do well, we would do very well to be able to jot those things down, record them thoroughly so that it reinforces our sense of confidence and that we can do something really well. At the end of a week, you may have seven of them. At the end of a month, you have 30. At the end of six months, you have, you know, hundreds. And the whole point is being able to look at that and review that the night before a competition where your stress level might be just peaking. And you go through your confidence journal and you look at all the stuff that you did in every training session, every workout, every day there was one thing that you contributed and what happens? Suddenly you get to the starting line and you don't feel like throwing up. You actually get excited because you feel like you belong there. It's not your first rodeo. You've been paying attention to all the things that you've been doing in your training and don't underestimate the value of that because athletes like anybody else get pegged with their arousal and their anxiety right before they have to perform. Yes, sir. Yeah, that reminds me of a really interesting uh, thing that was taking place when I was leaving school. Um, my uh, peers in the football team, they were started using virtual reality headsets mm -hmm. for high stress, high intensity you know, situations. So for instance, the quarterback and the kicker on the football team, uh, the kicker specifically, they surround him in the same environment as if he was kicking the game-winning field goal in overtime, um, just so that he could get prepared so that by the time he actually was kicking game-winning field goals, um, it would just be you know something he'd done a thousand times. Absolutely. So it's a similar mentality of getting in the you know the headspace of success, 
so that you're not surprised, you're not put off by when you're actually in those situations in real life. Have any of you met Bob at the Reality Garage down on the mall? No. Okay. So, um, between 13th and 14th Street, on the south side of the street, downstairs, there, that actually it's an office building, and downstairs they have a business called the Reality Garage. And they have all manner of virtual reality type of headsets and technology that they use. Now Bob's dad is a, a fellow Rotarian, and the, I belong to the Boulder Rotary Club, and Wayne was the guy that was teaching uh, Buzz Aldrin and these guys how to operate the lunar landing module for NASA. And so his son Bob is really into the uh, virtual reality piece and I would encourage you to go down there and there's one one little thing that I would have you try out and that would be called the plank. So just in case you may be a little skeptical as to just what you think this virtual reality might do, you go on the plank and just step off a little, you know, one and three quarter inches thick board and uh, and see what the sensation is to you. It, it will be something that I promise you, you will never forget and any concerns or questions you had about virtual reality will disappear because you will be amazed at what your experience of that is. Wow. So, in any case, uh-oh. Here we go. So, Routines, preparation, self-talk is hugely important. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about self-talk. Goal setting. Um, goal setting done right is a true science, and it's very difficult to do. There are a lot of people, I've had people come to me and say, so I'm asking them, okay, what do you want to have happen? If we have a really good collaboration here, what do you want to have happen? And I've had people say, well, I want to make an Olympic team. And I go, okay, and so tell me what's your event? And that was a concern because I know a lot of the people in, you know, that are really top performers in this area, and he wanted to make the Olympic team in the 5,000 meters, and his time maybe would have been top 200. Now, was that a realistic thing for him? That's the goal that he has? That's an outcome goal? Probably not. And the, and the issue with people when they make only outcome goals is that A, they don't have a plan for execution. You know, goal setting is, is different than dreams because goal setting, you have a plan for how you're going to make it so. And that may mean that you're breaking it down to process goals and you've got certain targets that you're wanting to hit along the way as you improve in your training. And that ability to break it down is really critical. All right, I'm going to move on. In October 2015, life was just great. Don and I went to a conference and I was learning how to be more fluent with the internet and was considering to learn how to do a launch. Uh, we went on vacation up in uh, Sayulita, Mexico and I took a hike through the jungle. But then there are other things that we've experienced in this community that haven't been so great. In 2013, the, how many of you were impacted by the floods in 2013? Did anybody lose everything in the flood? Huge. There were people that lost virtually everything. They don't even have photos because they lost their computers or they lost what they used to have. And so for me, November 2015 was very interesting. I came back from vacation. I wasn't feeling particularly well. Things weren't moving through my digestive tract. And I took a shower and I went down to the ER and I'm going, I don't know what's going on here, but, you know, things aren't moving. They take me in to do a CT scan and uh, the doc comes out and he says, uh, well, Steve, you've got an obstructed bowel. And uh, 
that wouldn't be as much of a problem except the obstruction is a big tumor and you've got cancer. So that point, uh, next stop was let's go ahead and stay at the hospital a few days. I had a surgical procedure. Uh, in that surgery, uh, the Charlie Jones, some of you may know, uh, performed an ileostomy, uh, which basically sidetracked my entire uh, digestive tract so that um, the rest of my colon was not involved in anything with respect to my digestion. And so I had to carry a bag around and then I got to have a little journey where I was experiencing uh, chemotherapy. So there are a few things that started to hit me at that point in time because the people I were working with were I was working with they were very high functioning people. Uh, I felt like I was doing great. I felt pretty much invincible. Not so much anymore. And so the key thing here is recognizing that life can change very quickly. You know, somebody has a bike accident. Uh, I had a friend had a bike accident going up four mile and uh, somebody locked handlebars with him. He's going up, they're coming down and boom, he goes over the handlebars and a pretty severe concussion. And he was lucky that he was wearing a helmet because the helmet almost split in two. So you never know. And you know, if you're, if you do downhill. I race cross country mountain bikes, endurance events. Cross country mountain bike. But you know, imagine doing downhill. My son races, yeah, and he's been, he was life flighted off of a helicopter at age 14 and off of Winter Park. So I know I've been Swell. There. I got to meet him in the ER, yeah. <laughs> Okay. So, yes. <laughs> All right. So I, I don't need to belabor the point, but, but I think it, it does as well if we can, in fact, at least acknowledge that we've got mortality that is waiting for us and we never know when that can happen. And so if we are really focused on what we're doing, how we're doing it, the priorities that we're living our lives with, then we'll be a lot better prepared. It's not so much what happens to us, it's how we react to it that counts. So when working with athletes, you know, I learned to focus on drills and preparation for making adjustments when things go sideways. And one of the things that I, I did, um, I'll go ahead and give you this woman's name. Her name is Carol Robin, and she has a website, carolrobin.com. And my sister sent me a recording that she she gave, which was preparation for cancer surgery. And it was about 48 minutes long, and it was a very, very interesting recording, not just doing certain skills with how to relax, breathing exercises, things like that, but she had a thing called the four steps to center that I think are, is, is really useful. And the Four Steps to Center is available in a recording, too, if you wanted to get it. It's not as long as the, the recording that I was listening to, but she covers four elements. The, the fourth step is just getting in touch with physiologically what's going on with your body, where your tension spots are. Are you clenching your teeth? Do you, are, are you holding a fist? What are you doing with your body and how are you relaxing it. And she gives you a little directed guidance, guided meditation on certain images and visualizations that you can employ that are just beautiful in terms of being able to release tension. And then she goes into the emotional aspects of it. Uh, think about the emotion of shame. Think about the emotion of fear. Think about the emotion of uh, just even embarrassment which could be in an environment where you're with friends and somebody makes a joke and you don't quite get it, but you don't want to make a big thing out of it, but you're confused. And, you know, you're trying to laugh because you want to be with the joke. You don't want to, to isolate yourself. But there's a little bit of fear in that. And there's a little bit of confusion in that. And there's a little bit of, of anxiety all the way around. So. Getting familiar and comfortable with understanding these emotions and being able to release them and let them go through a disciplined 
guided meditation, very useful. And then finally, um, she would focus on the, the intellectual, what's the chatter in the mind? The self-talk is in the previous slide. You know, it's where the rubber meets the road. What are you saying to yourself? Is it useful? Is it productive? Is it constructive? Is it going to help you? Or is it going to contribute to added anxiety or uh, discomfort that you might experience? So um, the preparation was pretty important. And sometimes you just have to breathe into it. And so that little exercise, let's do it again. All right. Nice, long, slow breath, heavy sigh. <sighs> Let it go, all right? And release your hands, shoulders, feet, everything. Just periodically, I'm gonna bring you back to that because if there's one thing I want you to walk out of this room with today, I want you to be practicing this exercise a lot. Anybody had a nasal gastric tube? Not fun. All right, this is my ileostomy, and I had a surgery along with the ileostomy, so that's called a stoma. And so I had to learn how to take care of it. Not exactly what I had in mind. Pretty damn ugly, isn't it? Yeah. Not exactly what you want. But you know what? It's the reality. Life changed that fast. I'm dealing with things that I never thought I was going to have to deal with. And all of those things that I was working with athletes on, in fact, helped me a lot in being able to manage this stuff. So, here we are, double dating with the Perlmans. And we're at the Tebow Infusion Center as we're undergoing chemotherapy. Kat's been diagnosed with breast cancer, and I'm dealing with colon cancer. And Dave is there for comic relief, and Donna is the one that's laughing at everybody. So, um, that's another thing that happens. You know, when you're an athlete, you're thinking about who's part of your support system. Who all is there? Your trainers, your coaches, you know, the people that are your loved ones, the people that really count in your world. And in what way are they, how are they helping you? And so this is really kind of a key element. That what is your support system like? And if you can surround yourself with people that can make you laugh in the most difficult of circumstances, consider all the ways in which that's valuable. Yeah. Being able to laugh in what's a... And this was... We were just on our way to feeling really lousy that night. But we had a good time in the process of getting there. Who knew biofeedback would be so helpful? We talked a little bit about it. We talked about the electrodermal response. Um, biofeedback was something that I did a lot of early on in my career. And I have taught different athletes that I'm working with how to deal with muscle tension. Um, one marathon runner that was, that was uh, competing in the Boulder Boulder was part of the US uh, women's team. And uh, I would ride my bike around on the course and check in on her from time to time. And I noticed her coming up uh, the, the street on, uh, oh, what is it, 13th Street over by the junior high school, the highest point on the, on the course. And she's doing this. And I just about died. So I, I run out in front of her. And I go, relax your jaw, relax your hands. Okay, so why would that matter? So for anybody that's done biofeedback, how, who's done biofeedback here of any kind? Okay, so let's say you're going to monitor muscle tension just in the frontalis here. And you might, when I was doing this, we would put everybody through a psychophysiological profile and we'd have them relax, and if they fell asleep, no problem. And then we would have them do something like, uh, start with the number 900 and subtract 7 and continue to subtract 7. And so they're engaged in this mental task. So they're going, 
893, 886, 879, and they're repeating that. Meanwhile, I'm noticing in their muscle tension that it's gone from maybe six microvolts on up to about 20. And all they're doing is calculations. And if I were to ask them, okay, so what about the last time that you were under a whole lot of stress? What's that like? Well, that might go up to 30. But I've asked him to do one thing. Oh, by the way, 30 what? What's the unit of measurement in biofeedback, muscle tension? Microvolts. It's a measure of electrical energy in the nervous system. And if you were to clench your teeth, that 30 might go up to 150. And she's running up the hill and she's doing... What's going to happen to her at the end of the race? She's going to want to go for it and she's going to have no juice left because she burned it all doing something that was not helpful in her race. So in terms of economy of effort and being able to conserve your energy, that's another one of those things. Now in this case, I was at uh, Anschutz and uh, I had been there in the uh, med surge ICU for about 10 days and I had a blood infection and it was not pretty and uh, it was at that point in time that I came pretty close to sepsis and had that occurred I would not be here. The experience itself was pretty traumatic but when I came out of that and they had to pull the port that I was using for chemotherapy because it was reinfecting my blood every time it was cycling through the port. And so once they pulled that and the antibiotics really started to work, I was out of the woods. And that was particularly useful. But there was one other thing that happened. Um, one of the mornings I would be awakened roughly 5.45 every morning because the surgeon would come in with his entourage and they would ask questions and they would check me out and they'd see how it goes and I love this guy Martin McCarter who is absolutely the master of the universe and uh, I thank Martin McCarter for being here. So I would do that and uh, this particular day McCarter's team leaves and in comes occupational therapy and they want me to do a whole bunch of tests. So they're doing grip strength stuff. They happen to bring a razor, which I really appreciated. And so I was standing in the bathroom and I was a little queasy on my legs, but I got to shave. Not a very good razor, it took a lot longer than I thought. And then after they were done, PT came in and they wanted me to do a six minute test, which is how far can I go in my walker while they're monitoring my blood pressure and heart rate and I've got an IV and all of that how far can I go around the hallway and I get up and I go around and I'm tired and I get back to the room and they settle me in and I notice my monitor my EKG monitor starts going crazy and so I had dropped into what's called a fib for anybody that is aware of that, AFib is an arrhythmia, and it's not a good thing, not in the hospital, not anywhere. Uh, the sensation is it's kind of like a trout flopping around inside your chest because your heart rhythm is not operating in a normal fashion. And so that was my next challenge, because AFib increases the probability of your throwing off a clot and you don't want clots happening because that's how people die. They have heart attacks, they have strokes, they have these kinds of things that are particularly problematic. And so I'm looking at this AFib and I'm going, this is not good. And I, I'm, the good news and the bad news. The good news is I knew a lot about medicine. The bad news is I knew a lot about medicine. And I knew that AFib was not something that I wanted to be carrying with me going forward. You know, it would cut my life expectancy, even in a full recovery, probably five years. So 
This was something that I was highly motivated to change. And so when I was done and I was able to rest, I asked the, the doc uh, in the ICU if I could borrow a stethoscope. And I had the stethoscope and I'm listening to my heart rate and I'm looking at the sine wave of my heartbeat. And I'm noticing that I've got this preemptive, this preemptive beat that's not supposed to be there. And so what did I do? So I went to my phone, I called up YouTube, and I programmed in to see a normal sinus rhythm. And for the next three and a half hours, I spent jockeying back and forth between the stethoscope and the sinus rhythm and what I was looking for and what I was trying to emulate through biofeedback, some of the techniques that I was using in biofeedback on my cell phone. And I did that for about three and a half hours and then it was time for me to go for a walk. And as I s sat up in the bed, I converted back to a normal sinus rhythm. Mm. And I haven't had any issues since then, but I did have to take warfarin or Coumadin as a, as a uh, medication to reduce the probability of me throwing off a clot. But at this point, I'm no longer on that and I feel great. So... I know you. I feel the prince. Good to see you. David? Yeah. You're talking to David? No. Anyway, David look familiar. We wanted a doctor in the room just in case your story. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good. So far, good. once you've got the you know, you So anyway, that was, uh, that was one of those little tools that I was able to use that I continued to employ. Now, as I was talking with Michael earlier, um, early on in my training, there was such an emphasis on the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, uh, the DSM-3, the DSM-3R, the DSM-4, now the DSM-5, and it is still heavily laden into those things that are wrong with people. What are the symptoms of any one of a number of mental disorders that people would have? And Martin Seligman, who was the president of the American Psychological Association back in 1995, started to change psychology because he was interested. He wrote a book called The Optimistic Child. And I thought that was kind of an interesting title. And then he started doing a whole lot of other research on, well, what is it that people are doing great things pay attention to? What's their psychology like? And he got some other people at Harvard that decided to study only optimal performance. And it has changed a lot of psychology, not just from the standpoint of what's wrong with us, but what can we alter so that we're bringing forth the best of us toward everything that we do. And so I'm, very, I'm forever indebted to him. For example... The tenets of positive psychology. So would you rather have a really great experience or would you rather have that new 4K, you know, fabulous, fabulous TV on your wall? What are you going to spend money on? How about you, Howard? Going on vacation. Going on vacation. Uh, I'd rather have the experience than the, than the stuff. It depends if it's a new bike or. <laughs> now but you're if I crossing. Have a new bike to have fun. Yeah, you're you're crossing boundaries there because we're going from the experience of a new bike that you want to be able to have. Well, I would experience. But like yeah, yeah, it's like you know people get these these expensive TVs right before the Super Bowl, you know, and they watch the Super Bowl and then you know they forget it. That's you know they just spent three thousand dollars on a TV you know, a week later. But that vacation that you go to, that you really enjoy, that you see all these things that you never thought you'd see before, or the adventure that you experience, that will last you a lifetime. And so it's, this, it's the study of these aspects of psychology that are really starting to change the way in which we're doing what we're doing. Pennsylvania, uh, Penn, 
has actually a graduate program in positive psychology. And they take about 100 students each year, and they have well over 6,000 that apply every year. It's one of the few programs in the country that is set up that way, and it's gaining momentum, and it's happening more and more. But the work that I do in sports psychology is specifically focused on how do you repeat optimal performance. Here's an example. You're a cyclist, and you're training, and you're working against an avatar. You're racing against an avatar that's on the screen right next to you. Okay, and it happens to be, you know, the final sprint and the Tour de France in a particular, in a particular course. Well, you would think that that would be a really strong motivator, and it really does. People perform their best, but you know where they perform their very best? When that avatar they're racing against is their personal best. Whoa, that's me. I know I can do that. Can I beat myself? And so what I'm doing when I'm working with people is the goal and the objective is for people to become the best version of themselves that they can be. And it, it's got to be measurable. And there are going to be certain things that they can do that are going to reinforce and emphasize the probability of getting there. And fun is one of the most important things. Athletes that really enjoy what they're doing, athletes that are having a peak experience, athletes that they're happy to train because they can train because they got through that injury a while back, and now they're feeling good again. These are the people that are really enjoying their sport, performing their very best, training their very best, and they're the, they're the kind of people that coaches love to have. The other thing, so this was taken also in 2015 at a double rainbow, and I'm cruising on 51st Street behind the reservoir, and it was absolutely gorgeous. So people that make you laugh, guys that you like to ski with, stuff that you do that is fun is highly underrated. So the things that I got from this whole experience was just the appreciation for having the opportunity to take another breath, mm -hmm. to have another day, to not waste it, to go all out, to maximize the way I am in relationship, to maximize the way I am with every moment that I've got to be here. Because I don't take anything for granted anymore. And that was a valuable, valuable lesson and I would get that from an athlete that maybe had a career-ending injury because they missed it. They'd give anything if they could perform again. And yet they have to reinvent themselves. And so another part of the work is where you take a negative and you have to turn it into a positive. And that requires a concerted effort. That's not something that just happens because you can tell somebody, well, what the good stuff is about what came out of their disaster. Mm -hmm. Because they're not ready to accept it. It takes a while for them to process all of that, to wrap their head around it in order to be able to move on and to go f forward from that point. John Wooden is my favorite coach wish he was around. The things that he taught athletes were just marvelous. We are creatures of habit. This technique, everybody take another centering breath. You practice that technique about every half hour, just do it once every half hour. And you're going to be centering yourself. You're going to feel better about what you're doing. You're going to be a lot more focused on what's going on around you. And you're going to be way better in your ability to respond to anyone that is in your purview. So the habit, I think, is a key one. Also, how many of you are married in this room? Okay. So here's, here's a technique for you. When you go home and you see your spouse tonight, your sweetie, 
and you're going to give them a hug like you always do, only this time change it up. All right? And so what you're going to do is say, look, we're going to try this thing today that I did in this session. And so what we're going to do is I, I'm going to sync breathing with you. So you make the hug. You're attached close enough to be able to feel them breathe. And you just go, now breathe two times. I'm going to follow you. And they inhale. You inhale with them. And they exhale, you exhale with them. And you go only as far as they go, and you stay with them as long as they stay with it. But you're going to match their breathing pattern. And then, okay, switch. You do it with me. And they have to follow your inhale, and they have to follow your exhale. Because we live in this world where we've got so much distraction, we've got so much going on, that by the time we get home and we feel discombobulated because of all the stuff that was happening and you really want to try and connect in your relationship because it's something that will anchor you, it will settle you down, this is a good way to do it. Two or three breaths one way, two or three breaths the other way. Stay with it until you're after, and then you can talk about whatever it is that you want to talk about. You've already synced up. I'm ready to do it right now. Okay, that's everything that I wanted to talk about today. I do want to point out a couple things. So, this lovely woman that's right behind you, over here, that's Donna. Now, the thing that I didn't tell you is that three weeks after I was diagnosed with colon cancer, Donna was diagnosed with breast cancer. And we're operating in our household, and we're looking at each other, and we're going... WTF. Now she had a radical mastectomy with a complete reconstruction three weeks before I went through a 13-hour surgery with Martin McCarter and Ahmed Jazeri and Brian Flynn and his crew. And they put together my insides and resected my colon and they did a good job. So she went through the same thing. You never assume. Always appreciate what you've got because you may not have it for long. Thank you very much for listening. I'm here for any questions that you might have and uh, we'll go from there. But it's a good place to start.